the empire was based in so many ways on complicity of capital, of individual groups who were who benefited from empire, from exploiting local grievances, but ultimately from conditioning the population of the colonies to believe in empire without the mental conditioning, without winning hearts and minds, the empire couldn't have existed. And and, and that mental colonization is something that fascinates me because I see it in my own family. You know, my mother was born in the empire. She was born in the Gold Coast, it became Ghana when she was six years old. And she was taught that she was from a savage place, that her background was one um, that was uncivilized and that progress was becoming more like British people, adopting the British language, practicing Christianity, aspiring to Britishness. And that act of mental colonization is replete throughout the empire. And it's not something that ends. It's not like a border that you can change on a map or uh, armed forces you can withdraw. It's something that is inherited intergenerationally. And I certainly was raised by somebody who had that conditioning. And I see people of my generation raising their children with that conditioning. And so the very deep psychological structures of empire absolutely still exist. And not only do they exist, but you are rewarded for displaying them. And we see that in Britain, that if you show your loyalty to the narrative of empire, if you welcome the idea, for example, that your success should be rewarded with an OBE, a, 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 a reward explicitly named after the empire, if you are a good immigrant and you show patriotism to that story and that history, if you celebrate it, you are rewarded. Similarly, in Britain today, if you talk about the true history of empire, about its multiplicitous history and its violence, you are punished, you're penalized, you're ostracized, you're told if you don't like it here, you should leave. And you're not a good citizen, you're not a good immigrant, that you're problematic and troublesome. And I say that from personal experience, because there is a whole right wing faction of the press. And I'm not talking about rogue QAnoners, I'm talking about editors of newspapers, columnists in some of our most prestigious publications, TV anchors who host the most popular programs in Britain who will regularly say that somebody like me is not entitled to belong here if I don't toe the line of gratitude for the history of empire. And I think that's the reality. And so when I see those dynamics, I see that the empire absolutely still exists and that people feel entitled to celebrate it and penalize those who don't fall in line. All four of my grandparents and then all of my aunties and uncles and my parents on both sides migrated to Australia from Lebanon in the 70s. And so in, in that way, I'm Lebanese or Lebanese Australian, but more specifically, I'm Leb. And it's really important uh, to, to recognize that the idea of the Leb is not so much shorthand for Lebanese. It's this unique identity that manifests itself around the time of the September 11 attacks, but even slightly before then, um, which was uh, what cultural theorists and anthropologists and sociologists call um, a, a hybrid formation. It's a, it's a hybrid identity. It has elements of Arabness in it. It also has el elements that are uniquely Australian in it. Um, and you were talking earlier about the African-American um, parallels. And you see in the ide idea of the lead, this unique category, you see, um, you see performances of African-American subaltern, you know, performance playing itself out. And what I found most fascinating about the idea of the lab is that, um, you know, in the, in, the, in the groups that I operated in and I, and I lived in, I had friends who were Indonesian background who identified as lebs, uh, Afghan, Iraqi, Palestinian, Jordanian, Syrian. Um, and so this, it's a kind of totally brand new identity. And so growing up in Western Sydney as a lab, you know, as this very unique and very marginalized and heavily scrutinized group, I, I just felt like from every you know, from day to day, I was being uh, scrutinized one way or another. Uh, you know, we talk about the uh, the 2005 Cronulla riots, but I have my own personal experiences of being in Cronulla and being physically assaulted literally by large groups of white men because of the way I looked and because of the way I walked and the way I dressed. I have memories of police officers targeting us and harassing us and, um, and uh, intimidating us and threatening us because of the way we looked. I have memories of cab drivers refusing to um, to uh, let me get in a cab unless I paid up front. I have memories of being targeted at airports uh, on my honeymoon, me and my white wife. I remember being at um, LAX airport and literally alarms going off when I went through the uh, 
you know, through the machines and being taken, separated from my wife and being inter interrogated for hours because of the way I looked and because of my name. I remember my first experience uh, of racism. I was five years old and this, the kids, the white kids in my school calling me a Lebanese prick. You know, and so it's, it's been this kind of lifelong experience of what it means to be a Leb and to be othered as a Leb in Australia.